section one of harper's young people volume one issue ten january sixth eighteen eighty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b harper's young people volume one issue ten january sixth eighteen eighty squirrels and wild cats the most graceful of all the little inhabitants of the forest is the squirrel it is to be found in nearly every country and is always the same merry frisky little creature the general name for the great squirrel family is sciurus a compound of two pretty greek words signifying shadow and tail the beautiful bushy tail being a universal family characteristic of the many varieties found in our northern woods the most common of all is the little chipmunk a beautiful creature of brownish gray with stripes of black and yellow on its back and a snowy white throat it is the only burrower of the family choosing some sheltered place under a stone wall or a clump of bushes it digs a hole which often descends perpendicularly for a yard or more before branching off into the winding galleries and snug little apartments some of which serve as storehouses where nuts corn and seeds of different kinds are hoarded away for its winter supplies the little corner of the burrow used as a nest is carefully and warmly lined with dry leaves and grass and here the tiny squirrel slumbers during the cold winter months chipmunks are very plentiful in the country and may be seen any sunny day scampering along the stone walls or up and down the trunks of nut trees their little cheeks if it is in the autumn puffed out round with nuts which they are carrying to their winter storehouse the larger varieties of squirrels which make their nest in trees are the red squirrel often found in pine woods as it is very fond of the cones of pine and fir trees the gray squirrel a magnificent fellow with such a voracious appetite that it is said one squirrel alone will strip a whole nut tree and the black squirrel a handsome glossy creature which is so hated by its gray brothers that both are never found together in the same nutting grounds as the gray are the most numerous at least in this part of the country they generally succeed in driving away the black members of the family so that they are not very often seen the little flying squirrels the dearest little creatures for pets are natives of the rocky mountains but are found in all parts of the united states they are very lazy and sleep nearly all day coming out at twilight for a merry frolic leaping flying or scampering at pleasure among the treetops they generally make their nest in some hollow trunk where it is very difficult to find them the nest of a gray or red squirrel is a wonderful piece of architecture it is usually built in the crotch of some large branch near or directly against the main trunk of the tree the spherical shaped exterior is a mass of interwoven twigs so carefully placed as to afford ample protection against rain or snow leaves and grasses are stuffed inside while the little bed where the squirrel nestles and takes its nap is of the softest and driest moss in this pretty snuggery five or six little squirrels are born early in the warm weather the mother is very watchful and very affectionate if any wicked boys disturb her or a natural enemy some beast or bird of prey comes near she takes her little ones in her mouth like a cat with its kittens and hastily carries them to a more secure hiding place the parent squirrels never go away from the nest but play and jump about on the branches near by until the little ones are strong enough to accompany them when the whole family may be seen springing from tree to tree or scampering up and down the tall trunks waving their beautiful tails and breaking the silence of the woods with their merry chattering they are wonderful jumpers and can spring from the highest branches to the ground without harm they are not runners but can jump so nimbly through the grass and dried leaves that it is impossible to catch them the favorite food of the squirrel is acorns nuts and seeds and grain of all kinds and it will sometimes nibble leaf buds and tender shoots of young trees in the spring its teeth are so sharp and strong that it will gnaw the hardest nutshell nothing is prettier to see 
than this graceful creature sitting upright its beautiful tail curled over its back gnawing at a nut which it skilfully holds in its forepaws as it is not afraid unless one approaches too near when it whisks out of sight in a twinkling its habits may be easily studied it is a very provident little animal and lays up large stores of nuts for its winter food as those which live in trees have no storehouse like that of the chipmunk they deposit their hoard in hollow trunks or under heaps of dried leaves nothing is more common than to find little stores of nuts in a snug corner in hickory woods carefully packed together by these cunning creatures squirrels make pretty pets and when captured young can be tamed and often become very affectionate a young squirrel may be allowed to run about the room and it will often be found curled up fast asleep in mamma's work basket or papa's pocket or some other funny hiding place as it grows older it becomes more mischievous and must be kept in a cage or books furniture and everything in the room will bear the marks of its sharp little teeth it belongs to the order rodentia or gnawing animals and if kept in confinement must be given a plenty of hard shelled nuts to use its teeth on its cage should also be kept very clean for the squirrel is the neatest little beast imaginable and spends much time at its toilet it is sad to think that this innocent playful denizen of the woodlands should have many and deadly enemies even in the forests of inhabited regions from which wild beasts have been driven hawks and owls are ever on the watch to pounce upon it and in the wild woods especially in cold countries where the squirrels are most plentiful there are many enemies pine martens which climb trees and spring from branch to branch almost as nimbly as the poor little squirrel they persecute and the terrible wildcat which seeks its unsuspecting prey by night or in the twilight when the squirrels are gambling merrily among the leafy branches before cuddling to sleep in their little nests with sly caution the wild cat creeps noiselessly through the underbrush and with one savage spring it destroys the peace of some poor little squirrel family wild cats although they belong to the same great family as the quiet little pussy which likes to sleep on the hearth rug are considered by naturalists to be an entirely different species they are much larger than the domestic cat and have a short stubbed and very bushy tail they are terrible enemies of birds and all these small inhabitants of the forest and will often attack animals larger than themselves they pass most of the day stretched out upon some large limb of a tree sleeping after the fashion of cats with one glistening eye always on the watch for prey at night they descend and creep through the underbrush searching for food they are very skillful at fishing and are often found near large ponds where they watch not only for fish but for all kinds of water birds which haunt the surrounding marshes they seldom attack men unless enraged or brought to bay woe to the hunter who fires a careless shot for the angry beast springs at him with great fury and inflicts fearful and sometimes even fatal wounds with its sharp claws it has no fear of dogs and will pounce upon them sometimes killing them before the hunter can come to the rescue Tshuti, the swiss naturalist tells of a wounded wildcat which lying on its back fought successfully with three large dogs holding one fast in its teeth while with its claws it dealt powerful blows to the other two with singular instinct aiming at their eyes until the hunter by a skilful shot put an end to the conflict killing the ferocious beast and relieving the poor dogs which were nearly exhausted End of section one. Section two of Harper's Young People, Volume One, Issue Ten, January sixth, eighteen eighty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume One, Issue Ten, January sixth, eighteen eighty section two the history of photogen and nycteris a day and night merican by george macdonald begun in number five of harper's young people december second 
Chapter 18 Refuge Continued You come then, or I shall shut them, said Nycteris, and you shan't see them any more till you are good. Come, if you can't see the wild beast, I can. You can, and you ask me to come, cried Photogen. Yes, answered Nycteris, and more than that, I see them long before they can see me, so that I am able to take care of you. But how? persisted Photogen. You can't shoot with a bow and arrow, or stab with a hunting knife. No, but I can keep out of the way of them all. Why, just when I found you, I was having a game with two or three of them at once. I see, and sent them too, long before they are near me, long before they can see me or scent me. You don't see or scent any now, do you? said Photogen uneasily, rising on his elbow. No, none at present. I will look, replied Nycteris, and sprang to her feet. Oh, oh, do not leave me, not for a moment, cried Photogen, straining his eyes to keep her face in sight through the darkness. Be quiet, or they will hear you, she returned. The wind is from the south, and they cannot scent us. I have found out all about that. Ever since the dear dark came, I have been amusing myself with them, getting every now and then just into the edge of the wind, and letting one have a sniff of me. Oh, horrible! cried Photogen. I hope you will not insist on doing so any more. What was the consequence? Always, the very instant, he turned with flashing eyes and bounded toward me. Only he could not see me, you must remember. But my eyes being so much better than his, I could see him perfectly well, and would run away round him until I scented him, and then I knew he could not find me anyhow. If the wind were to turn and run the other way now, there might be a whole army of them down upon us, leaving no room to keep out of their way. You had better come. She took him by the hand. He yielded and rose, and she led him away. But his steps were feeble, and as the night went on, he seemed more and more ready to sink. "'Oh, dear, I am so tired and so frightened,' he would say. "'Lean on me,' Nycteris would return, putting her arm round him or patting his cheek. "'Take a few steps more. Every step away from the castle is clear gain. Lean harder on me. I am quite strong and well now.' So they went on. The piercing night-eyes of Nycteris descried not a few pairs of green ones gleaming like holes in the darkness, and many a round she made to keep far out of their way, but she never said to Photogen she saw them. Carefully she kept him off the uneven places, and on the softest and smoothest of the grass, talking to him gently all the way as they went, of the lovely flowers and the stars, how comfortable the flowers looked, down in their green beds, and how happy the stars, up in their blue beds. When the morning began to come, he began to grow better, but was dreadfully tired with walking instead of sleeping, especially after being so long ill. Nycteris, too, what with supporting him, what with growing fear of the light, which was beginning to ooze out of the east, was very tired. At length, both equally exhausted, neither was able to help the other. As if by consent they stopped. Embracing each other, they stood in the midst of the wide grassy land, neither of them able to move a step, each supported only by the leaning weakness of the other, each ready to fall if the other should move. But while the one grew weaker still, the other had begun to grow stronger. When the tide of the night began to ebb, the tide of the day began to flow, and now the sun was rushing to the horizon, borne upon its foaming billows, and even as he came, Photogen revived. At last the sun shot up into the air like a bird from the hand of the Father of Lights. Nycteris gave a cry of pain, and hid her face in her hands. "'Oh, me!' she sighed. "'I am so frightened!' The terrible light stings so. But the same instant, through her blindness, she heard Photogen give a low, exultant laugh, and the next felt herself caught up. 
she who all night long had tended and protected him like a child was now in his arms borne along like a baby with her head lying on his shoulder but she was the greater for suffering more she feared nothing nineteen the werewolf at the very moment when photogen caught up nycteris the telescope of watha was angrily sweeping the tableland she swung it from her in rage and running to her room shut herself up there she anointed herself from top to toe with a certain ointment shook down her long red hair and tied it round her waist then began to dance whirling round and round faster and faster growing angrier and angrier until she was foaming at the mouth with fury when falca went looking for her she could not find her anywhere as the sun rose the wind slowly changed and went round until it blew straight from the north photogen and nycteris were drawing near the edge of the forest photogen still carrying nycteris when she moved a little on his shoulder uneasily and murmured in his ear i smell a wild beast that way the way the wind is coming photogen turned looked back toward the castle and saw a dark speck on the plain as he looked it grew larger it was coming across the grass with the speed of the wind it came nearer and nearer it looked long and low but that might be because it was running at a great stretch he set nycteris down under a tree in the black shadow of its hole strung his bow and picked out his heaviest longest sharpest arrow just as he set the knot on the string he saw that the creature was a tremendous wolf rushing straight at him he loosened his knife in its sheath drew another arrow halfway from the quiver lest the first should fail and took his aim at a good distance to leave time for a second chance he shot the arrow rose flew straight descended struck the beast and started again into the air doubled like a letter v quickly photogen snatched the other shot cast his bow from him and drew his knife but the arrow was in the brute's chest up to the feather it tumbled heels over head with a great thud of its back on the earth gave a groan made a struggle or two and lay stretched out motionless i've killed it nycteris cried photogen it is a great red wolf oh thank you answered nycteris feebly from behind the tree i was sure you would i was not a bit afraid photogen went up to the wolf it was a monster but he was vexed that his first arrow had behaved so badly and was the less willing to lose the one that had done him such good service with a long and a strong pull he drew it from the brute's chest could he believe his eyes there lay no wolf but watho with her hair tied round her waist the foolish witch had made herself invulnerable as she supposed but had forgotten that to torment photogen therewith she had handled one of his arrows he ran back to nycteris and told her she shuddered and wept but would not look twenty all is well there was now no occasion to fly a step farther neither of them feared any one but watho they left her there and went back a great cloud came over the sun and rain began to fall heavily and nycteris was much refreshed grew able to see a little and with photogen's help walked gently over the cool wet grass they had not gone far before they met Fargu and the other huntsmen. Potagent told them he had killed a great red wolf, and it was Madame Watho. The huntsmen looked grave, but gladness shone through. Then, said Fargu, I will go and bury my mistress. But when they reached the place, they found she was already buried, in the maws of sundry birds and beasts which had made their breakfast off her then fargo overtaking them would very wisely have photogen go to the king and tell him the whole story but photogen yet wiser than fargo would not set out until he had married nycteris for then he said the king himself can't part us 
and if ever two people couldn't do the one without the other those two are nycteris and i she has got to teach me to be a brave man in the dark and i have got to look after her until she can bear the heat of the sun and he helps her to see instead of blinding her they were married that very day and the next day they went together to the king and told him the whole story but whom should they find at the court but the father and mother of photogen both in high favour with the king and queen aurora nearly died for joy and told them all how watho had lied and made her believe her child was dead no one knew anything of the father or mother of nycteris but when aurora saw in the lovely girl her own azure eyes shining through night and its clouds it made her think strange things and wonder how even the wicked themselves may be a link to join together the good through watho the mothers who had never seen each other had changed eyes in their children the king gave them the castle and lands of watho and there they lived and taught each other for many years that were not long but hardly one of them had passed before nycteris had come to love the day best because it was the clothing and crown of photogen and photogen had come to love the night best because it was the mother and home of nycteris were they not both ripening however to bear the power of a brighter sun still when the one should follow the other into a yet larger room the end End of section two. End of the history of Otogen and Nycteris by George MacDonald. Section three of Harper's Young People, Volume one, Issue ten, January sixth, eighteen eighty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 10, January 6, 1880. Putnam's Narrow Escape by Benson J. Lossing. Many years ago, I was riding in a light carriage between Greenwich and Stamford in Connecticut. After descending from high ground by a road cut through a steep declivity, I observed some rude stone steps upon the abrupt slope which were half concealed by shrubs and brambles. An old man was standing at a dooryard gate nearby, and I inquired of him the meaning of those steps. Before the Revolutionary War, he said, the people from this way, when going to the church on the hill yonder, had to go nearly a mile around. To give those who were on foot a nearer cut, those steps were placed there. They are the rocks, he continued, that people believed old putt, went down when he escaped from the british dragoons at horseneck he didn't go down the steps at all but went zigzag from the top to the bottom of the hill very near them i stood just here listening to the firing above when i saw the general rushing down the hill like a madman as he seemed for you see it is very steep as he flew past me on his powerful bay horse all bespattered with mud i heard him cursing the british who had pursued him to the brow of the precipice but dared not follow him further my informant was general ebenezer mead the whole story may be briefly told putnam and a few foot soldiers were attacked near the church by some british dragoons on a warm morning in march seventeen seventy nine so much greater was the number of the assailants than the americans that the latter fled for safety to the swamps near by their leader who was mounted turned his face toward Stamford. Finding himself in danger of being caught, he wheeled suddenly, his horse at full speed, and descended the declivity as described. The dragoons dared not follow him in his perilous ride, but sent pistol balls after him. Putnam escaped unharmed to Stamford, where he quickly gathered the militia and rallied some of his scattered followers. Then he pursued the invaders in turn as they retreated toward New York and making nearly forty of them prisoners he recovered much of the plunder which they were carrying away with them those famous steps associated with one of the perilous feats of a bold american soldier may be seen at this day not far to the right of the highway as you go from greenwich 
to stamford hare and hounds i have never taken part in hare and hounds but i feel as if i had because in the first place i have read tom brown and in the second place i have a brother who is devoted to athletics and who has just returned from a run with his club it is just like a real hunt only all the animals are human beings two boys are hares and carry bags full of scraps of paper which they scatter as they go any number of boys are the hounds and follow this paper scent two boys are the whippers in who call the pack together with great tin horns one boy is master of the hunt and does nothing in particular though he is supposed to arrange everything my brother got up at an unearthly hour on the morning of his hunt in order to meet his fellow dogs and their prey at the grand central depot at nine o'clock i am sure that he was over an hour before time though he will not own to more than a quarter of it i know that he had a jolly time anyway but i will give his report in his own words such fun we ran twelve miles twelve miles just think of it why we got way up round spoyton doyville from highbridge you know but first you know we all met at the depot then when we got to highbridge we went to the hotel and changed our things we started from there we only intended to run twelve miles but the hares took us twenty they meant to take us up to yonkers they said never mind they got the worst of it they had to run the fastest you know didn't we tear through the country up hill and down dale over stone walls and brambles and down swamps one fellow got up to his knees in water we lost the scent once near a railroad track and it took us about five minutes to find it the hares had colored papers pink blue white and yellow and they looked quite pretty scattered all over the ground the people about the country seemed to take a great deal of interest in us one or two told us which way the hares had gone a policeman too near highbridge told us they seemed to understand all about it i thought they'd think we were crazy a whole lot of fellows in white caps tearing through the country in that way oh that reminds me two little boys asked one of our fellows what we were going after two men what have they done stolen our watches and they stood staring after us with their eyes and mouths as wide open as as oh anything oh i must tell you one time just as we were going along the road we heard a tremendous noise on the other side of the fence we thought it was one of the whippers in blowing the horn it sounded exactly like it and we turned round and there we saw a little donkey coming hee-hawing over the hill after us a pretty little gray donkey then one of the whippers in blew the horn and the donkey was just delighted tickled to death he hee-hawed and capered about and ran alongside of the fence wanted to join us had a fellow feeling i suppose just then a little girl came running out of a house calling him she was afraid we were going to hurt him or something i suppose and when we looked back again he was standing still just as quiet as could be and the little girl had her arms around his neck it made me think of titania in shakespeare you know we did have a run i can tell you one of our fellows got hungry and stopped at a farmhouse and got some bread and goose i wish i'd thought of it too some of the country we went through was beautiful up by the hudson we could see the river winding along and catch glimpses of the palisades perfectly beautiful we couldn't have had a better day just cold enough and not too cold we were awfully tired though and hungry you'd better believe it why it was two o'clock when we got back to the hotel and we had started at ten you know four hours didn't we go for that dinner just as soon as we changed our things they kept it waiting for us since twelve didn't we eat turkey cranberry sauce potatoes cider coffee pumpkin pie and i don't know what besides we were almost too hungry to enjoy it at first but we did eat i had two plates of turkey and four cups of coffee the coffee was pretty weak but we made up for it by taking enough i think we must have scared those hotel people the man and his wife and daughter waited on us and we did carry on so firing things at each other you know and then after dinner we went up to the parlor and played and sung college songs up a d and coca chalunk and all those things such a row as we made but coming home in the elevated was the worst how those fellows did carry on just imagine about twenty of us my gracious what a noise we did make 
we kept the car in a roar one fellow would go eo and then another fellow would go oh ah and then they'd all go together one of the fellows put his head out of the window and another fellow immediately dragged him in and began patting his hair down as if it was a wig you know we made puns on each other's names and whistled and sang and oh carried on like sixty one man with a black beard laughed at us ready to kill himself and a brakeman on the back platform was grinning from ear to ear well we did have a day of it i can tell you but won't we all be as stiff as bricks to-morrow i will only add that i do wish i had been one of those boys but i am glad that i wasn't that hotel keeper the school children's welcome saturday december twentieth was a splendid holiday for the school children of philadelphia all through the week they had been reading of the receptions given to general grant in honor of his return from his journey around the world and now they were to take part in a welcome of their own there was in the first place a grand street procession of boys to the number of nearly four thousand quite an army in fact who marched in four great divisions each headed by a band the boys were well drilled and stepped gaily to the music with soldier-like bearing and precision as the general rode between their lines he was greeted with enthusiastic cheers no doubt he was as much gratified by this boyish welcome as by the grand military display that attended his entry into the city after reviewing the lads general grant was escorted to the academy of music where almost as many schoolgirls as there were boys in the procession were assembled to give him a reception of a gentler kind it must have been a pretty sight more than three thousand lassies all in their teens and all in their best attire as soon as he appeared two thousand sweet voices joined in the grand melody of hail to the chief which was sung with enthusiasm and fine effect the general acknowledged the courtesy in a short address several other speeches were made interspersed with patriotic songs of all the festivities of the week the one general grant will probably remember with most pleasure will be the reception given him by the boys and girls of the public schools end of section three section four of harper's young people volume one issue ten january sixth eighteen eighty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by Juanita yoder harper's young people volume one issue ten january sixth eighteen eighty the school children's welcome saturday december twenty was a splendid holiday for the school children of philadelphia all through the week they had been reading of the receptions given to general grant in honor of his return from his journey around the world and now they were to take part in a welcome of their own there was in the first place a grand street procession of boys to the number of nearly four thousand quite an army in fact who marched in four great divisions each headed by a band the boys were well drilled and stepped gaily to the music with soldier-like bearing and precision as the general rode between their lines he was greeted with enthusiastic cheers no doubt he was as much gratified by this boyish welcome as by the grand military display that attended his entry into the city after reviewing the lads general grant was escorted to the academy of music where almost as many schoolgirls as there were boys in the procession were assembled to give him a reception of a gentler kind. It must have been a pretty sight, more than three thousand lassies, all in their teens and all in their best attire. As soon as he appeared, two thousand sweet voices joined in the grand melody of Hail to the Chief, which was sung with enthusiasm and fine effect. The general acknowledged the courtesy in a short address several other speeches were made interspersed with patriotic songs of all the festivities of the week the one general grant will probably remember with most pleasure will be the reception given him by the boys and girls of the public schools old probabilities 
The next time the professor came, it was in a dense fog. The morning was so damp and disagreeable that we hardly expected to see him. He did not disappoint us, but seemed to have come almost before the sun was fairly up. It was so dark. What makes a fog? asked Gus. I meant to have talked about something else, Gus, answered the professor, but you have chosen a subject for me. It is a very good one, too, and quite suitable to the occasion. Fogs are nothing more nor less than clouds. They usually float aloft, a mile or more, high, but sometimes drift down to the ground and lie all around us. They are so light that they rise and fall from very slight causes when there is no wind. A brisk breeze soon drives them off. But what are clouds made of? inquired May, who has become such a favorite with the professor that she never hesitates to stop him when she wants anything explained. Clouds, May, are made up of small particles of water, or vapor, slightly chilled. When vapor or steam is hot, it cannot be seen, but is invisible like the air. You have noticed the steam from a tea kettle. Near the spout, it is hidden, but a little further off, where it has got cooled by mixing with the air, it begins to look gray, like a cloud. If the kettle be allowed to boil a long while, so that a large quantity of steam is formed, it will collect on the walls and window panes, where, becoming thoroughly chilled, it turns again to water, the same as it was when first poured into the kettle. So it is with the clouds out of doors. When the sun comes out bright and hot, it dries them up, as we say. That is, it heats them so much that they become invisible. Cool air mingling with them brings them into sight again, and, if cool enough, it condenses. Oh, dear! The professor laughs. There can be no doubt about it, May. Science is full of big words. We will say that the cool wind makes the clouds heavy by squeezing them together and sends them down in drops of rain. This is called condensing. May rewards the professor for his simple explanation with such a bright glance that he proceeds with an illustration. You have made soap bubbles and seen how they will float around in the air and sometimes be wafted clear up above the trees until they get broken when they come down drops of water. The particles of vapor that form clouds are little bubbles, or hollow spheres filled with air. When a cold wind crushes them, they become solid, unite with one another, and fall as raindrops. Cold water is much heavier than air, but water made hot by fire or by the sun and turned into vapor is lighter. In time of a fog, the vapor is just warm enough to have the same weight as the air so that it neither rises nor falls, but remains quietly near the ground. Professor, remarked Joe, did you not say that when the sun came out bright and hot, it dried up the fog? And is not the fog the very thing that keeps the sun from coming out? Yes, my dear, but fogs usually gather at night, and when the sun rises in the morning, he goes to work at once to heat them up and make them disappear. But when he finds them very thick and is hindered by cold air, he may be a good part of the day in working his way through, or he may even have to go down before he is able to show himself. Generally, however, he gets help from the wind, and then the fog goes off in a hurry. Is there no way, asked Gus, of knowing when the wind will spring up and give us some clear cold weather? Ted Winant's cousin has an ice boat, and we are all waiting for a ride on the river. There is old probabilities, said Jack but he could only tell a day or two ahead, and seems rather uncertain at that, and afraid to express a decided opinion. It is a little this or a little that, a little cloudy or a little cooler, and the wind is to blow a little in nearly every direction. Most people laugh when they talk about him, as if he was not of much account, or had grown stupid in his old age. If he would only foretell a hurricane or a deluge, and bring it around, why, then we would know what he is good for. Such a test would be rather costly, said the professor, smiling. It is better to give the old gentleman a little time to establish his reliableness, for in truth he is yet very young, a mere child of eight or ten years. And considering that he undertakes to forewarn our whole country as to the coming weather, so that everybody will have time to get ready for it, we must admit that he is doing all that his age warrants. Where does he live? asked Gus. We have been talking somewhat absurdly, replied the professor. Instead of a single person, 
There is what is called the United States Signal Service, which has been in operation eight or ten years, and comprises some two hundred or more men, scattered all over the country, from Maine to California, and from the Gulf of Mexico away out to the northwestern lakes. The men at these various stations watch the weather very closely, and at a particular time every day send word regarding it by telegraph to the main office at Washington, where the different reports are carefully studied, and an opinion formed as to what the weather is likely to be in different sections of the country during the next 24 hours or more, and the result is then published in the daily newspapers and at the numerous post offices throughout the land. The matter is yet somewhat uncertain, and occasionally mistakes are made. But will they ever get so that they can tell exactly every time? We hope so. The warnings given are usually right, and are becoming more and more reliable every year. In 1872, it was estimated that about 77 out of 100 of them were found to be correct. More recently, they have been declared accurate about 90 times in 100. So, you see, good progress is being made, and the signal service system is becoming very useful to the nation, for property and life can often be saved from destruction when the approach of a severe storm is known. The New York Herald has encouraged the study of the weather for many years, and its managers now send word to England by the Atlantic Cable when a storm is to be expected there. They have lately sent notice of so many ugly ones, which have promptly arrived, that our English cousins are complaining of the unfair treatment of the Herald. Are they really so absurd? asked Jack. Yes, said the professor. They facetiously intimate that when Providence controlled the weather, they fared well enough, but that since the Herald has undertaken to run that department, they have been doomed to storms, fogs, and rain. To give an instance of the faith, Jack, that the English people put in our signal service, there is a story told of an English lady who last autumn desired to give a lawn party. The season was an unusually rainy one, and such entertainments had, in consequence, been given up. The lady, however, sent her invitations, and calmly announced that the day she had selected would be clear. When asked how she had dared to take such a risk, she replied, There was no risk whatever. I had telegraphed to the man in New York. The children all laughed, and it was some time before the professor could quiet them sufficiently to add the few words that concluded his little lecture. The most violent storms have been found generally to whirl in circles, and are called cyclones. In some parts of the world they are very disastrous. One occurred in India in 1864 that destroyed 45,000 lives in a single day. Ten years earlier, when the English and French were at war with Russia, a storm was observed to begin in France and to be moving eastward. Timely warning was sent to the Allied fleet in the Black Sea. The storm came with such terrific violence that, had it not been expected, it would probably have destroyed one of the most splendid navies that ever rode the waters, and perhaps have changed the issue of the war. End of section 4 Recording by Juanita Yoder Section number 5 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1 Issue 10, January 6, 1888. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 10, January 6, 1880. Trouble in the Playroom I don't care. I'm just as mad as I can be. To keep me in just for a little rain? I won't be good. I won't play with my dolls. I'm going to whip every one of them and put them to bed this very minute. Such a little termagant, as Bessie Hatch looked at that moment, with her black eyes flashing, her hands clenched, and her cheeks like two flaming poppies. Half irritated, half amused, Annie, the Irish nurse, regarded her for a moment. Indeed, but it's a swight temper you have, Bessie Hatch, and I hope for your own sake It'll be minded afore you grow up. It's not I'll be letting you out. When your ma lift particular orders, you wasn't to go if it rained. Just hear how the storm's baiting again. The windows. Your cousin won't expect you at all. 
Oh, bait your dolls as much as you like, as Bessie made an angry rush toward them. It won't hurt their feelings much, I guess. There's baby crying, she added suddenly, and hastened toward the room at the end of the hall. Bessie, meantime, had snatched her largest doll from the chair where she was reposing, and belabored her soundly with a piece of whalebone that lay near at hand. Then, after shaking her heartily, she tossed her onto the bed, where she lay with her black eyes shut, as if overcome by her feelings. She has a very handsome wax doll, with chestnut hair done up like a lady's in puffs and curls. She had a somewhat haughty expression, carried her head a little to one side, and was dressed in the latest style. Grace, a porcelain-headed doll, dressed simply in blue muslin and a white apron, received her punishment next, and was deposited by Miss Augusta's side. But Winnie, dear Winnie, Bessie's favorite doll, could she have the heart to punish her this way? Winnie, with her golden brown curls and beautiful hazel eyes, and her dear little face rounded and molded like a child's. How lovely was her smiling mouth! With what confiding affection she seemed to look up at Bessie, as the latter took her up in a hesitating way. But the recollection of her lost pleasure came back to her, and with it the spite and anger that had animated her a moment before. Winnie received her whipping like the rest, but instead of tossing her on the bed, Bessie set her back in her little chair, turning her face to the window, that she might not see it. Somehow her anger seemed to have spent itself with that last whipping, and a feeling of shame was creeping into her little heart. She had intended to go through her baby house, chastising all its inmates, but instead she took a picture book and lay down on the lounge by the window. How quiet everything seemed! Annie carried baby downstairs to feed him. She heard no sound but the murmur of the sewing machine in the next room, where Jane Kennedy, the seamstress, was working. She felt drowsy and sleepy. Slowly her head sank down among the cushions of the lounge, and the drooping eyelids closed. A rustling sound near her made her open them with a start, and in a minute more she was sitting bolt upright, staring with all her eyes. For there stood a little figure, no taller than Winnie, dressed in a white fleecy robe trailing on the ground. Her soft black hair reached to her feet, and over it she wore a wreath that sparkled like dewdrops in the sun. Some fear mingled with Bessie's admiration as she gazed upon her, for a frown was on the fairy's brow, and the dark eyes she fixed upon the child were full of displeasure. Tap, 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 came the sound of little feet approaching. Bessie looked round, then shrank back, terror-stricken. Well, she might, for her dolls, Augusta and Grace had somehow found the use of their limbs, and were rapidly nearing the lounge. But they paused not far from the fairy, and reached out their little hands to her with a supplicating gesture. Kind fairy, good fairy, they sang in shrill piping voices, avenge the wrong done to us. That child, calls herself our mother, has beaten us cruelly, just because she had nothing else to vent her spite upon. We had done no harm in any way. Punish her, good fairy, make her sorry for having treated us so. I will give her into your hands, said the fairy gravely. See that you punish her as she deserves. Bessie, who lay trembling and burning with mingled fear and shame, now rallied her courage and raised her head again. She could not help laughing at the idea of her own dolls punishing her. You foolish little fairy, she said, laughing. I could manage them both with one hand, and if... She stopped aghast, for the fairy raised her wand, and it flashed like a dazzling sunbeam full in the child's eyes. She covered them with her hands, glancing up just in time to see the fairy float away on her silver wings. But how came she, Bessie, on the floor, and why did it seem like a great meadow stretching around her? The lounge had become a mountain, and the ceiling of the room looked nearly as broad as the sky. It was the same room, the same familiar objects. Only how monstrous everything had grown. Was that immense building in the corner? Her baby house? Bessie's little head swam. Her heart beat tumultuously. A light mocking laugh near her made her glance quickly round. Who was this tall figure in a trailing gray silk, looking down on her with severe triumph in her black eyes? That chestnut hair, the beautiful red and white complexion. Could this be Augusta? Her own doll? With a scream of terror, Bessie was darting away, but waxen fingers seized her tender little arm, closing tightly upon it. Oh, how they hurt! She struggled and kicked, but could not get away. Let me go, she cried out. I'll pay you off well, Miss Augusta. If you don't, remember you're my doll. Pay me off? 
cried Augusta, with another shrill laugh. You poor silly midget! Don't you know how the fairy's wand has changed you? Why, you don't reach to my knee. No, I am going to pay you off, and handsomely, too. Grace, bring that piece of whalebone directly. If you dare, cried Bessie. But Grace clattered up toward her, her stolid countenance fairly beaming. Bessie tried to dodge behind Augusta, but she held her tightly by both arms. Lay it well over her shoulders. Grace, make em tingle, she cried, and thick and fast fell the blows, while poor Bessie writhed and protested and threatened in vain. When Grace's arm was tired, Augusta took her turn. After beating Bessie to her heart's content, she seized the child by her shoulders and shook her until her head fairly turned round. There, she said, tossing her on the doll's bed in the corner. Lie there, miss, till Winnie comes. Poor thing, she's gone away to cry somewhere. But as soon as she comes back, she'll have her chance. Come, Grace, we will go for a walk. She walked haughtily away, followed by the admiring Grace. Poor Bessie lay sobbing and crying. Her shoulders and back were smarting, her little arms black and blue from the pressure of Augusta's fingers. I'll run away and hide somewhere, she said at last. Creeping off the bed very cautiously, she was stealing away, when something seized her again. She gave a cry of despair, and looking up, saw Winnie's sweet face. Who are you? she asked. Are you a new doll? Holding her gently but firmly. Oh, Winnie, said Bessie, and hid her face in shame. Augusta came mincing up with a triumphant air, and related the actions of the fairy. Now it's your turn she said, handing the whalebone to Winnie. But she tossed it indignantly aside. Strike her? Never! No! I would rather remember her kindness to me. Don't cry, little mother, she adding, stooping to kiss her. If the fairy comes again, I will ask her to change you back. No, no, cried Augusta and Grace in a terrible fright. But Bessie did not hear. She was sobbing with her face in Winnie's neck. Oh, Winnie, Winnie, how can you be so kind? I would rather you gave me a beating. But Winnie wiped her eyes and smiled so brightly on her that Bessie's heart began to revive a little. Ere long they were playing together, and it would have been rare sport for any child to see Winnie wheeling Bessie in a tiny tin cart no bigger than a matchbox. Then they had a grand game of hide-and-seek. In the stocking basket, Annie had left on the floor. Grace soon joined them, while Augusta, quite gracious by this time, sat eyeing them complacently from her armchair. Bessie, Bessie, your mamma's come in and wants to see you. Bessie started up rubbing her eyes. She looked in a dazed sort of way at Annie, then at the corner where she kept her dolls. There they sat, all three in a row as usual. Who put them there, my dolls? Did they really whip me? She asked confusedly. Then she blushed and hung her little head. Who put them there? Why, well, I reckon they got tired of lying on the bed and walked over to their chairs, said Annie with a mischievous gleam in her eye. You put them there, said Bessie, but she wished she could feel quite sure. Catching up her darling Winnie, she walked off to her mother's room. All the rest of that day, Bessie treated Augusta and Grace with the utmost respect, and when she undressed them and put them to bed, she lingered as if anxious to say something. At last she stooped down and whispered, I don't believe it's true, but I'll never whip you or get into such a passion again. I didn't know how ugly it was till I saw you behave so yourselves. And please, if it is true, don't ask the fairy to make me little again, for I mean to be good now. As for Winnie, darling Winnie, she lay all night in Bessie's arms, her head hugged close to her breast, and the piece of whalebone stood bolt upright in Bessie's matchbox, where she had stuck it, that it might always remind her of the lesson of that day. End of section number five. Recording by April 6090, California, the United States of America. Section six of Harper's Young People, Volume One, Issue 10, January 6, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How Aunt Pam Became a Smuggler by Mrs. Frank McCarthy My name is Tom Barnes, and I live on the other side of the river, just far enough from New York 
to go there once in a while with Pa to a show. That's all the city's good for, anyway. We can't get up shows here very well, but when it comes to other fun, we can beat you city folks all hollow. You see, you haven't got the things to work with that we have, the woods and water and things. But I'll tell you about Aunt Pam. Her name is Pamela, I think, but we call her Pam for short. She wasn't ever married, though I guess she's old enough. Somebody once said Aunt Pam was an old maid, but that can't be, for old maids are always cranky and get out of bed backward every morning. Now Aunt Pam was never cranky in her life, and I know she gets out of bed like everybody else, for I've slept with her many a time, and nobody in their senses will call Aunt Pam old, and you better believe she's jolly. The house ain't anything without Aunt Pam. My sisters are all girls, you see, and so taken up with worsted work and practicing and one thing and the other that I don't know what I'd do without Aunt Pam. I tell her everything, but I couldn't about the smuggler's cave because the fellows wrote it all down in black and white and we took a solemn promise to keep it a secret. We all live close to the water and having everything handy, we made up our minds we'd make a smuggler's cave. We got to work lively, and while some of the fellows were digging out the bank, others chopped down small trees and bushes and made a covered archway to crawl under so that the opening of the cave couldn't be seen. We pulled the young twigs and vines down over the chopped ones, and rolled logs inside for seats, and things began to look quite ship-shape. It was no easy job, I can tell you. We worked like beavers to get the cave the way we wanted it. But when it was done, it was what you may call hunky-dory. Bill Drake's father had a flat-bottom boat that we got into and rowed along shore. We rigged up a sail, but there was something the matter with it, and it kept flopping about and wasn't much good. But anyhow, it looked nice. We never went far from shore. We weren't afraid, but we didn't care to. Smugglers always kept along shore. We all had blue shirts and pulled our caps down over our eyes to look fierce. And Bill Drake kept an old pipe of his father's in his mouth. It hadn't any tobacco in it, but it was a real pipe, so we made Bill captain. The thing was to get lots of traps into the cave to look like smuggled goods. We fished up old bathing pieces and bits of broken bottles, and Bill brought down a red petticoat. But the best of all was Aunt Pam's shawl. Now, I'd scorn to do a mean or sneaking thing, especially to Aunt Pam, but she didn't seem to care a button for that shawl. I didn't think it was worth two pence. She used to wear it in all sorts of weather, and it looked to me as if it was patched up out of bits she hadn't any other use for. I'm sure she'd worn it since she was a baby. I could remember seeing that shawl around as long as I could remember anything, and it was just the thing for our cave. It was kind of like a Turk's best turban as to color. And when it was fixed over Bill Bates's bathing suit and one corner hung down over the rock, it made the cave look bully. I went into Aunt Pam's room one morning and found it thrown over the foot of the bedstead like an old blanket, and I carried it off to the cave. When I came home from school, I saw Aunt Pam out walking with a worsted thing that one of my sisters made for her, and I thought it was enough side handsomer in the way of a shawl. I went on down to the cave, and when I got home again, there was a regular hullabaloo in the house. The girls were ransacking the closets, Aunt Pam was flying around like a hen with its head cut off, and everybody was turning everything inside out. Maybe Tom's seen it, said Mama. Tom, have you seen your Aunt Pam's shawl? That old thing she used to wear around, I said. Old thing, they all shrieked together. Why, it's a camel's hair shawl. It's worth five hundred dollars. Oh, no, I said. I beg your pardon. There wasn't the hair of a camel or even a cat in the shawl that I mean. It was just sewed together on the wrong side like a bed quilt. That was it, you ridiculous boy, said my sisters. Have you seen it? Seen it, said I. I've only seen it every day since I was born, and yet I remember it well. I went whistling away and they began to rush around again for that shawl. I felt pale under my whistle. Five hundred dollars! Who'd have thought it? Down in the smuggler's cave, goodness gracious! No wonder it looked just the thing. No wonder we all caught into that shawl from the start. 
I always told you something would happen to it, said Mama to Aunt Pam. You flung it around like an old rag. That was the comfort of it, said Aunt Pam. It couldn't be hurt. It could be worn in all weathers, to a wedding or a funeral, to church or to a clam bake. It was always in the fashion and everybody knew what it was worth. Except me, I said under my breath. Oh, my beautiful shawl, said Aunt Pam, beginning all at once to feel the full shock of her loss. The tears rolled out of her dear old eyes, and my sisters began to snivel, as they always did. Mama said it must be looked into, and for a moment I was scared. I thought of the smuggler's cave. What must be looked into, I said. Why, the loss of the shawl, said Mama. It must have been stolen out of the house. Our upstairs girl was passing through the room when Ma said that, and she turned red and pale. Did you notice Maggie? Mama said when the door was shut. Oh, Mama, we all cried out, for we thought the world of Maggie. I couldn't help wondering how it was that she was so red and flustered while I was cool as a cucumber. Aunt Pam declared she wouldn't have Maggie's feelings hurt for the world, and I said she was innocent in a deep, low, solemn voice but nobody paid any attention to me. Then I stopped to think before I went on. How could I betray my comrades and the whereabouts of the cave? I remembered the last piece I spoke in school and how I hollered out the words, Oh, for a tongue to curse the slave whose treason like a deadly blight comes o'er the counsels of the brave and blasts them in their hour of might. Could I be that traitor? No, indeed, not much. Yet here was a dreadful row in the house, and the only way to mend matters was to get that shawl again as soon as possible. I resolved to get it that very night, and when I listened to an advertisement that Aunt Pam had written out for the paper, I saw my way clear. She said no questions would be asked if the article was promptly returned. That settled it. I went up to my room, and I wrote out the following in a disguised hand. Secret and Confidential the shawl's all right. I waited till after supper, slipped it under Aunt Pam's door, and going out the back way, I took a cross cut down to the shore. Now, Pa won't let us go out at night to play, and I think that's a mistake, because we can't get used to the dark if we don't. The whole world looked queer somehow to me by starlight. The moon hadn't come up yet, and at first I could hardly see my hand before my face. I never saw such ugly shadows. And once, I had to stop and get my breath before I could make up my mind to pass a clump of old mulberry bushes. Once in a while, I heard a crackle behind me like a footstep, but I didn't look back. I knew my only chance was to plod ahead no matter how my heart thumped or my knees shook. I thought of everything I could to bolster me up, of dear old Aunt Pam and poor little Maggie, but the sound of the waves on the beach was awful. They roared like so many wild beasts. It was black as ink on the water, and the twinkle of the lighthouse seemed a hundred miles away. It was so lonely and wild that my heart was in my throat. And suppose, thinks I, when I get in the cave, the waves come up and devour me. Suppose somebody's crawled in there to sleep, some tramp or something, and he should catch me by the leg. Or the bank should tumble in on top of me. All my spunk was gone, and I turned to run when, bunk, I came into something behind me. Ow, screamed I, and oh, screamed somebody. Wasn't I glad to find it was dear old Aunt Pam? She scared me, though, for she was as white as any sheet, and grabbing me in her arms, she began to cry over me. Tell me all, Tom, she said. I got your note and I followed you. You bad, wicked, dear little wretch. Tell me everything. If the shawls got lost, never mind, Tom. I don't care. Only tell me and come back home. Poor dear Aunt Pam. She told me afterward she thought I had done something to the shawl and ran away in my fright. We were both pretty well broke up and I couldn't help crying a little bit myself. But of course, I couldn't go home now without the shawl. I began to feel as brave as a lion now Aunt Pam was there. The thing was to get her out of the way while I went to the cave. It looked awful down there in the hollow, and the wind was getting up and the water swashed around, and I couldn't help thinking there might be a tramp in there. 
all at once a bright thought struck me. Aunt Pam wasn't afraid of tramps. She wasn't afraid of anything. And after all, it was her shawl. If it was worth having, it was worth going after. But how about betraying the boys? Another bright thought struck me. I'd make Aunt Pam one of us. She could say the words over after me, and she could crawl in and get the shawl while I kept guard outside. And if anybody says Aunt Pam is old after that, they must be crazy. She said all the words solemnly, one after another, and then she crawled in and dragged out every blessed thing she could lay her hands on. I put them all back the next morning, and the best of all was that Aunt Pam never gave us away. She just told the folks she found the shawl herself, and she did, you know, didn't she? End of section six. Section seven of Harper's Young People, volume one, issue 10, January 6th, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 10, January 6, 1880. Mathematical Puzzles, Number 5. Two boys kept neighboring apple stands, and each had 30 apples to sell every day. One sold his at the rate of two for five cents and received seventy-five cents, and the other at three for five cents and received fifty cents, the total being one dollar and twenty-five cents. It happened one day that one of the boys was sick, and the other engaged to sell the whole stock of sixty apples at the same rate. Two for five and three for five, that's five for ten, said he, and five for ten he sold them. But to his astonishment, when he got through, he had but one dollar and twenty cents instead of one dollar and twenty-five cents now how did he lose five cents number six how old are your children asked a lady who was visiting a friend the mother of three beautiful daughters my oldest daughter is just double the age of my youngest daughter replied the mother and the age of my other child is that of her youngest sister and one-third more their three combined ages make exactly the sum of my age and i shall be sixty-six one year from today. what was the age of each of the three daughters the oldest rosebush in the world they say it is the oldest and who knows that it is not i will tell you the story as it was told to me and you shall see what you think of it there is a funny old town in germany called hildesheim a little out of the way of travellers but full of curious and interesting things and over its fine cathedral walls climbs a rose bush so large and strong that it may well be a thousand years old as they say it is a thousand years ago said the sacristan the country all about here was a forest if you have studied history you will see the story may be true so far for you know charlemagne became emperor of germany in a d eight hundred and that germany was little better than a wilderness then one day continued the sacristan louis the gentle the son of charlemagne went hunting with all his retinue in this forest they had with them a box of relics relics you must know were pieces of the dress of martyrs and saints or something that martyrs and saints had touched in their lifetime or perhaps even the bones of martyrs and saints when they encamped for dinner the gentle louis wished to put this box of relics away very carefully and looking about he saw a beautiful blooming rosebush which must have been quite large even then as he concealed the box in its branches perhaps they hurried away in pursuit of game after dinner or perhaps they ate too much and as often happened in such a case they forgot to be as religious as they were before dinner however it was at all events they rode away without the relics and never missed them till the next day then Lewis was full of shame and declared they must ride back again and never give up searching till they found the box. So they rode for many a weary hour, searching the byways of the forest, for there were few roads, till at last they all suddenly stopped, full of awe and wonder. It was a beautiful June day, and the birds were singing, 
and the flowers were blooming but lo just before them they saw a glade in the forest where the fresh white snow lay like a soft thick carpet over everything and yet it did not cover everything either for in the centre of the glade grew a lovely rose bush with hundreds of bright blossoms upon it and this was the bush in which the box had been hidden lewis hastened forward and grasped the box but lo here was another miracle it had grown into the wood of the rose bush so firmly that it could not be taken away then lewis fell on his knees and said he would receive this as a sign and he vowed to build a cathedral on the spot they called the snow holy snow because it had hidden the ugly remnants of their feast with its purity but had left the rose bush free and they named the cathedral and the town which sprang up about it hildesheim which in old old german meant holy snow it is certainly an enormous rose bush and its roots grow wide under the cathedral over them in the crypt is an altar said to be of pure silver and it looks as if it might be on the altar are heaped great bunches of artificial roses which they persuade the ignorant peasants are actual blossoms of the rose bush itself even when it is leafless and bare in the winter i cannot say that all the sacristan's story is true but i know that the rose bush of hildesheim is the largest one i ever saw and that the town is a very old place indeed a few years ago some wonderful gold and silver vessels were dug up there which must have been used by an almost forgotten race if any of you live near washington you can see copies of them in the smithsonian institution crochet purse this pretty purse will make a nice gift for some of our young people it is worked with red saddler silk in open work double crochet and consists of an oblong bag pointed toward the bottom and furnished with small slits at the top on both sides the purse is closed with two metal bars finished with knobs and joined with a chain and ring an ordinary steel slide may be substituted a metal acorn finishes the bottom make a foundation of ninety-six stitches close these in a ring with one slip stitch and crochet the first round four chain stitch the first three of which count as first double crochet then always alternately one double crochet on the second following stitch one chain finally one slip stitch on the third of the first three chain in this round second round one slip stitch on the next stitch four chain stitch the first three of which count as first double crochet then always alternately one double crochet on the next chain in the preceding round one chain finally one slip stitch on the third of the first three chain in this round next work twenty four rounds like the preceding round but in the last ten rounds narrow at intervals and instead of one double crochet pass over two double crochet so that in the last round only eight double crochet are worked run the working thread through the stitch of the last round draw it tight and set on the acorn then finish the purse in two parts working on the upper side of the foundation stitch three rounds in the preceding design going back and forth and in the last round fasten in the bars as follows asterisk seven chain pass over two double crochet lay on the bar from the wrong side carry the chain across the bar to the wrong side one single crochet on the next chain stitch seven chain stitch carry these over the bar to the front pass over two double crochet one single crochet on the next chain stitch and repeat from asterisk end of section seven section eight of harper's young people volume one issue ten january sixth eighteen eighty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nema harper's young people volume one issue ten january sixth eighteen eighty aunt de Cumba in the parlor of a dear old-fashioned country house two elderly ladies are seated one knitting 
the other reading the report of yesterday's sermons, giving bits aloud now and then. On the carpet, a little boy of about three years of age is sprawling, apparently trying to swim on dry land. The lady knitting is Miss Helena Oakstead. The lady reading is Miss Judith Oakstead. And the small boy is Master Ralph Oakstead, the eldest son of the youngest brother. If you go to the other side of the hall, you will find the eldest brother, Master Ralph's uncle, in his study, writing an essay full of great big words. He is Professor Oakstead. Master Ralph is spending the day with his relatives, and has gotten on with them very well so far, as his sister Daisy, two years his senior, whom he rules right royally, has acted as court interpreter. But she has just departed for a drive with a neighboring friend, and the aunts are left in sole charge of his highness. He is very gracious at first, looks over a picture book with Miss Helena, and makes eager but unintelligible remarks respecting the bow-wows and moos, to which Miss Helena answers, um, dear, as being the safest thing to say. But now he is silent, and has been so for at least ten minutes. How good Ralph is, half whispers Miss Helena. His Highness pricks up his ears. Yes, dear little fellow, and he has no one to play with either. His Highness sits up. He speaks. Aunt de Combo. What is it, dear? says Miss Judith. Aunt de Combo, repeats Master Ralph. What does the child mean? asks Miss Helena. I don't know. What do you want, Ralphie? Ralph, with a look of mingled contempt and pity at his stupid relatives, says slowly but emphatically, Aunt de Combo. Perhaps he is hungry. I'll go and get him a piece of cake, says Miss Helena. The cake is brought, and promptly accepted. But it is evidently not the thing for which his soul longs. For after devouring half the slice, he plaintively murmurs, Aunt de Combo. Well, isn't that de Combo? says Miss Judith. Ralph gives her a scornful look as sole answer and finishes his cake in awful silence. As the last crumb disappears, he sighs. Aunt de Combo. What on earth and under the sun does the child want? Is the combined exclamation of the ants. Perhaps Elijah can help us. Oh, yes, he knows everything pretty nearly. But he may not like being disturbed now. He's writing, you know. Well. Perhaps Victoria might be able to tell. She used to take care of children. So Victoria is summoned from the kitchen. She is a tall, majestic negress, who looks as if she had just stepped out of history. Her speech does not quite come up to her stately mien. Why, wow, what's the matter with the child? She queries. All of Ralph's reply is lost except de Cumba. Well. Come along with Victoria. She get you combo. What? Ain't gwine to come? Oh, laws, that ain't being good boy. For Master Ralph has seated himself flatly on a footstool, and with his back against the wall, refuses in the dumbest of dumb show to be entrapped into gwine anywhere. Miss Helena suggests that they bring to him whatever they find that is at all likely to be de Cumba. So, at the feet of His Royal Highness, is laid such a queer collection of articles as never before appeared in that trim sitting-room. A child's history of England, a bottle of mucilage, a pair of scissors, a coal shovel, a comb and brush, a bunch of flowers, a photograph album, a bottle of ink, and goodness knows what besides. Miss Helena ransacks her brains and her bureau. Miss Judith brings every portable in the room, 
and Victoria literally squanders the contents of her larder. But all to no purpose. And what is worse, His Highness, becoming alarmed at such unusual behavior, begins to moan. Aunt de Comba, in a way that draws tears to the eyes of his aunts. Judith, exclaims Miss Helena, the case is getting desperate. We must send for Elijah, no matter if he does get angry. Victoria, just go to the study and tell the professor that he must come here for a few minutes. Do you hear? Must. Victoria, looking as scared as only a solemn-natured darky can look, departs and returns speedily with a professor. Is anything the matter with Alcibiades? he asks. Alcibiades, be it known, is what the professor always calls Ralph, for short, he says. He is in a most peculiar condition, Elijah. Persist in calling for Decomba, and we cannot understand what he means. What is it that you want, my boy? inquires the professor, bending his dignified back and knees, so as to bring his gray head on a level of Ralph's curly pow. Ralph turns to him with an expression of relief, as much as to say, well, here's a reasonable being at last, and explains, Aunt de Cumba. And what is de Cumba? says the professor. De Cumba, repeats Ralph, with a lingering hope that perhaps he is going to get some satisfaction. But this creature is just as dull as the rest, and his highness, with a great want of dignity, begins to whimper. The child seems to be in pain, says the professor standing up and regarding his nephew with concern. Perhaps he has hurt himself. I never thought of that, cries Miss Judith. Have you hurt yourself, Ralphie? Aunt de Combo is the only response. Looks like he gwine to have a fit. I give de child a good warm bath if I was you, suggests Victoria. Miss Helena eagerly catches at the straw. That's a good idea, Victoria. Just fill the little foot tub with hot water and bring it right in here. Victoria hurries off to get the bath, and the professor, seized with a new idea for the explanation of the mystery, goes to his study to search his dictionary for de Cumbo in some dead or living language. The foot tub is brought and the ants proceed to undress his highness, whereat he waxes wroth. They persist, there is a frightful howl, a struggle, and the tub of hot water is very vigorously overturned among the photographs, scissors, and eatables that strew the floor. The professor, in alarm, comes tearing in, a book in each hand. At that moment, a patter as of small feet is heard in the hall and a little figure with flying golden locks darts into the room. Ralph rushes into her arms in a kind of ecstasy, crying, Oh, de Comba, de Comba! What is it that Ralph is saying, Daisy? eagerly asks Miss Helena in the lull that follows. He has been wanting de Comba all the afternoon. He says, Daisy, come back, answers the little girl. That's what you wanted, wasn't it, Ralphie? Ass, me aunt de Cumba, assents his highness. The professor regards his niece with humble admiration, not unmixed with awe, and retires to his study to lay his dictionaries by. Victoria rolls her eyes ceilingward and says, Well, I declare, then falls to work, picking up the runes of their various offerings and the two ladies turned to help her, after a little silent astonishment. Ten minutes after, His Highness is seen in the garden pouring sand down his sister's neck, and sternly ordering her to fit till, when she objects in a tone that makes his aunts wonder if this can be the same boy who spent the greater part of two hours in wailing, Aunt de Cumbo. End of Section 8
Section 9 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 10, January 6, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Engel. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 10, January 6, 1880. Little Birdie. Come here, little birdie, and don't be afraid. I would not hurt even a feather. Come here, little birdie, and pick up some bread to feed you this very cold weather. I don't mean to hurt you, you poor little thing, and Pussy Cat is not behind me. So hop about pretty and put down your wing and pick up some crumbs and don't mind me. Cold winter is come, but it will not last long, and summer we soon shall be greeting. Then remember, sweet birdie, to sing me a song in return for the breakfast you're eating. A Scarecrow, No Scarecrow An umbrella for a scarecrow was in a cornfield placed, and with loud caws the sly old crows around it gravely paced, when suddenly a shower fell and under it they went, and stayed until the rain had ceased, as in a little tent. Then said they, as they all trooped out, That man's a jolly feller, not only plants the corn for us, but lends us his umbrella. THE PARADISE OF INSECTS None but those who have traveled on the upper Amazons can have any idea of the number and veracity of the insect torments which work their wicked will on the bodies of the unfortunate exposed to their attacks. The sanquidos, or small sand flies, form by far the most important section. In the villages round which the forest is cleared away for some distance, the sanquidos are generally pretty quiet during the day except where darkness prevails. There they are ever busy, and are a perfect plague. The triumphant note of a sanquido which has made his way under your curtains is more annoying than even his bite, and should you have been careless in getting into bed, and been accompanied by two or three of these bloodsuckers, we will defy you to sleep until you have exterminated them. In the forest and on the river the sanquidos are always busy. Men sometimes get into the vessel's tops, and there cover themselves with sacks, notwithstanding the heat, rather than remain below exposed to their attacks. Fortunately, they cannot stand a current of air, and so when under way the vessel is comparatively free from them. But when at anchor those pests are something awful. To get rid of them is next to impossible. Creosote will keep them off, but the remedy is as bad as the disease. Whitewash will drive them away, but when dry its power ceases, and the only thing to do is either to cover all exposed parts of the body with black pigment, a la mode indienne, or else to grin and bear it. Scarcely less troublesome than the sanquidos are the mosquitoes, although they have the negative merit of biting only by day. They are minute creatures, not much larger than a pin's head. They prefer the backs of the hands to any other spot for their attacks. But unlike the sanquido, which, when undisturbed, gorges himself until unable to fly and becomes an easy prey to your avenging finger, the mosquito never seems to take too much to prevent his easy escape on the slightest appearance of danger, being evidently as wide awake when full as when empty. Everywhere in long grass lurks the moquim, a little red insect so small as to be almost imperceptible but which fastens on the legs, causing the most intolerable itching. There is a fly which burrows in the skin and deposits an egg, both in human beings and animals. This produces a maggot, similar in shape to that of the common blowfly, but much larger, probably analogous to the guinea worm. Then there are chigos, which burrow mostly in the soles of the feet. You feel an intense itching, and on examination, find a little thing like a pea just under the epidermis. This is the bag containing the young chigos, which must be carefully picked out with the point of a knife, and the cavity left filled with tobacco ash. Huge spiders abound, whose very appearance inspires a wholesome dread of a nearer acquaintance, but which are harmless enough if let alone. In fact, on board the steamers, almost every cabin is tenanted by one large spider, whose presence is tolerated on account of his being a deadly foe to cockroaches, which abominable creatures swarm on board. Sometimes he is not visible for a fortnight or more at a time, but he leaves tokens of having been there, 
in the shape of the empty husks of cockroaches, from which he has carefully extracted the interior. These spiders have the power of springing upon their prey from a distance, and some of them are so large and powerful as to kill and devour small birds. In passing through the narrow forest paths, it is necessary to be on the lookout for wood ticks, which are very difficult to get rid of if once firmly attached. Also for the huge black ants, an inch and a half in length, with stings like a hornet's, and the sauba ant, without sting, but armed with nippers like a pair of surgical bone forceps, which are running about everywhere. One may sometimes chance upon a column of the dreaded fire ants, marching in regular military order, and if he does, the only thing is to bolt at once, for neither man nor beast may withstand the fire ant and live. When at length the traveler stops to rest, he must take care to examine the camping ground, to see that neither centipede nor scorpion is there. Frequently, both centipedes and scorpions are found on the steamers, introduced, no doubt, in the wood used for fuel. One day, while the writer was watching the hands taking wood from canoes alongside, from one of the logs pitched on board was dislodged a scorpion, which fell on the naked left arm of a man keeping tally at the gangway. Astonished by his sudden flight through the air, the animal remained perfectly still. The man never moved a muscle, and quietly raising his finger, flipped it away with his finger and thumb. It was very neatly and coolly done, and he thus escaped a sting, which he, no doubt, would have received had he tried to brush it hastily away. End of section 9section 10 of harper's young people volume 1 issue 10 january 6 1880 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jill ingle harper's young people volume 1 issue 10 january 6 1880 advertisements harper's young people will be issued every tuesday and may be had at the following rates payable in advance postage free single copies four cents one subscription one year one dollar fifty cents five subscriptions one year seven dollars subscriptions may be in with any number when no time is specified it will be understood that the subscriber desires to commence with the number issued after the receipt of order. Remittances should be made by post office money order or draft to avoid risk of loss. Advertising The extent and character of the circulation of Harper's Young People will render it a first-class medium for advertising. A limited number of approved advertisements will be inserted on two inside pages at 75 cents per line. Address, Harper and Brothers, Franklin Square, New York. A liberal offer for 1880 only. Harper's Young People and Harper's Weekly will be sent to any address for one year, commencing with the first number of Harper's Weekly for January 1880, on receipt of $5 for the two periodicals. Plays for Young People with Songs and Choruses adapted for private theatricals, with the music and necessary directions for getting them up. Sent on receipt of 30 cents by Happy Hours Company, No. 5 Beekman Street, New York. Send your address for a catalog of tableau, charades, pantomimes, plays, reciters, masks, colored fire, etc., etc. Historical Stories for the Young The Boys of 76 a History of the Battles of the Revolution by Charles Carlton Coffin, profusely illustrated, octavo, cloth, three dollars. It is full of interest from beginning to end, and there are thousands of old boys and girls, too, from one to four score in years, who will read it with all the zest of youngsters. Mr. Coffin is an admirable storyteller for old and young, and understands how to draw a lively picture of the scenes he describes. His book presents a vivid personal and battle history of our revolution, and it is profusely and strikingly illustrated with portraits and scenes on almost every page. Lutheran Observer, Philadelphia It is not a book for boys alone, but
but a well-arranged and carefully prepared history of the War of the Revolution, profusely illustrated with authentic sketches of battlefields, historic places, and buildings, nearly three hundred in all. It is altogether a very attractive book. Observer, New York. It aims at giving a complete, though necessarily brief, view of the War of the Revolution, from the commencement of the Battle of Lexington, April 19, 1775, to the disbanding of the army at Washington's headquarters at Newburgh, New York, and the subsequent signing, on the 3rd of September, 1783, of the treaty at Paris between the English and American Commission. The facts are carefully arranged and are well told. All the prominent actors in the war are brought to light, and the exact date of all the leading events are minutely given, and the whole is written in a spicy and often thrilling style. Conversations are introduced. Characters are happily drawn. The author is most happily fitted for such writing. He will always have the ear and the heart of every boy. Christian Instructor, Philadelphia The Story of Liberty by Charles Carlton Coffin Profusely Illustrated Octavo, Cloth, Three Dollars So long as boys and girls read intelligently such books as this, the country and the world will not swing back into the bleakness of darkness. We warmly commend to every household such a book as this. Observer, New York The author has not confined himself to the English sources of the current, which it is his business to trace. That current was largely fed from all over the continent of Europe, and the whole broad field of European history Mr. Coffin may be said to have explored in search of his materials. He has combined these into an orderly, graphic, spirited narrative, with a ready eye for the picturesque points of fact and a skillful handling of the more dramatic situations. The great events which fill the pregnant period under review are grouped about the central idea of the book with a good sense of proportion. Congregationalist, Boston. Authentic history put in the most attractive form. Its simplicity, fullness, and purity of style will make it a favorite volume with all who love historical studies. We hope that a book so full of good, healthy reading will be placed in the hands of many thousands of boys and girls of America. Lutheran Observer, Philadelphia Mr. Coffin avoids the formality of historical narrative and presents his material in the shape of personal anecdotes, memorable incidents, and familiar illustrations. He reproduces events in a vivid, picturesque narrative. New York Tribune Published by Harper and Brothers, New York Sent by mail, postage prepaid, to any part of the United States on receipt of the price. Skates and Novelties Send for Catalog, R. Simpson, 132 Nassau Street, New York A most enchanting story for boys, Pittsburgh Telegraph An Involuntary Voyage, by Lucien Biart Author of Adventures of a Young Naturalist Translated by Mrs. Cashel Hoey and Mr. John Lilly Illustrated Duodecimo Cloth, $1.25 a very charming book, brimming full of adventures, and has not an uninteresting page between its covers. Baltimore Gazette A book that is at once novel and entertaining. All the book is lively, and the voyagers have some adventures, the telling of which is as entertaining as any book of Jules Verne's, besides having nothing in them that is improbable or extravagant. Philadelphia Bulletin A most enchanting story for boys, it is a story of adventure and also contains much interesting and useful information. Pittsburgh Telegraph A narrative crowded with adventure, told in the lively and graphic style for which the French writers of books for boys are so noted. Cleveland Herald One of the most attractive books of the season, spirited sketches of travel and adventure on the ocean wave, among the islands and on southern coasts, fill these chapters. But the main point which gives them their highest flavor is the experience of naval warfare during our late civil conflict. Observer, New York Published by Harper and Brothers, New York Sent by mail, postage prepaid, to any part of the United States, on receipt of the price. A book for everybody. Ninth edition now ready. How to get strong and how to stay so. 
by William Blakey with illustrations. Sexto Decimo Cloth, $1. Your book is timely. Its large circulation cannot fail to be of great public benefit. Rev. Henry Ward Beecher. It is a book of extraordinary merit in matter and style, and does you great credit as a thinker and writer. The Honorable Calvin E. Pratt of the New York Supreme Bench. A capital little treatise. It is the very book for ministers to study. Rev. Theodore L. Kyler, D.D., in New York Evangelist. It is unquestionably one of the most practical and useful books on this topic which have ever been published in this country. New York Evening Express. We know of no man in America more capable of writing such a book, or who has a better right to do so. Rutland Daily Herald and Globe. It will pay any person, whether a farmer or lawyer, laborer or idler, schoolgirl or a housewife, to buy and read it, and follow its teachings. Springfield Union. A veritable treasury of muscular common sense. Charleston News and Courier. Published by Harper and Brothers, New York. Sent by mail, postage prepaid, to any part of the United States on receipt of the price. Model working, toy engines and figures. We send engine, figures, pulley, etc., all complete as per cut, and in working order by mail for $1.25. Peck and Snyder, 124 and 126 Nassau Street, New York. The Fairy Books. The Princess Idleways by Mrs. W. J. Hayes. Illustrated. Sexto Decimo. Cloth. 75 cents. The Catskill Fairies by Virginia W. Johnson. Octavo. Illuminated Cloth. Gilt Edges. Three dollars. Fairy Book Illustrated. Sexto Decimo. Cloth. One dollar fifty cents. Puscat Mew and Other New Fairy Stories for My Children by E. H. Natchpool Hugeson, M.P. Illustrated, Duo Decimo, Cloth, $1.25. Fairy Book, The Best Popular Fairy Stories Selected and Rendered Anew by the author of John Halifax. Illustrated, Duo Decimo, Cloth, $1.25. Fairy Tales by Jean Mosset, Translated by Mary L. Booth. Illustrated. Duodecimo. Beveled Edges, $1.75. Gilt Edges, $2.25. Fairy Tales of All Nations by A. Aboulet. Translated by Mary L. Booth. Illustrated. Duodecimo. Cloth. Beveled Edges, $2. Gilt Edges, $2.50. The Little Lame Prince by the author of John Halifax, Gentleman. Illustrated. Square Sexto Decimo. Cloth. One dollar. Folks and Fairies. Stories for Little Children. By Lucy Crandall Comfort. Illustrated. Square Quarto. Cloth. One dollar. The Adventures of a Brownie. As Told to My Child. By the author of John Halifax, Gentleman. Illustrated. Square Sexto Decimo. Cloth, 90 cents. Published by Harper and Brothers, New York. Sent by mail, postage prepaid, to any part of the United States on receipt of the price. What Mr. Darwin Saw in His Voyage Round the World in the Ship Beagle. Adapted for Youthful Readers. Illustrated, Octavo, Cloth, $3. A capital book on natural history for young readers. Hartford Current. A superb volume filled with maps and pictures of beasts, birds, and fishes, as well as of the faces of all sorts of men, and with all this a most delightful story of real travel round the world by a very famous naturalist. Christian Intelligencer, New York To the intelligent boy or girl, the book will be a perfect bonanza. Every statement it contains may be accepted as accurately true. This book shows once more that truth is stranger than fiction. Philadelphia, North American. It can scarcely be opened anywhere without conveying interest and instruction. S.S. Times, Philadelphia. Published by Harper & Brothers, New York. Sent by mail, postage prepaid, to any part of the United States, on receipt of the price. Fragrant Sozodont. 
is a composition of the purest and choicest ingredients of the vegetable kingdom. It cleanses, beautifies, and preserves the teeth, hardens and invigorates the gums, and cools and refreshes the mouth. Every ingredient of this basalmic dentrifice has a beneficial effect on the teeth and gums. Impure breath caused by neglected teeth, catarrh, tobacco, or spirits is not only neutralized but rendered fragrant by the daily use of sozodont. It is as harmless as water and has been endorsed by the most scientific men of the day, sold by druggists. A Book Beyond the Pale of Criticism, New York Daily Graphic The Boy Travelers in the Far East, Adventures of Two Youths in a Journey to Japan and China Illustrated, Octavo, Cloth, $3 A more attractive book for boys and girls can scarcely be imagined. New York Times the best thing for a boy who cannot go to China and Japan is to get this book and read it. Philadelphia Ledger Juvenile literature seems to have come to a climax in this book. In literary quality and in material form, it is a decided improvement on anything of the kind ever before produced in America. New York Journal of Commerce One of the richest and most entertaining books for young people, both in text, illustrations, and binding, which has ever come to our table. Providence Press. Published by Harper and Brothers, New York. Sent by mail, postage prepaid, to any part of the United States on receipt of the price. A nice gift for children. Pittsburgh Telegraph. The Princess Idleways, a fairy story. Illustrated. Sexto Decimo. Cloth. 75 cents. Written in a simple but charming manner and illustrated by beautiful pictures so that a youngster just past the first reading hook would appreciate every word. Christian Intelligencer, New York The illustrations are worthy of special commendation. Any so airy, pretty, and full of grace have rarely appeared in any American book for children. Hartford Current The language in which it is told is so pure and agreeable that parents and good bachelor uncles will find it a pleasure to read aloud to the little ones. Boston Courier. Published by Harper and Brothers, New York. Sent by mail, postage prepaid, to any part of the United States on receipt of the price. End of section 10. Recording by Jill Ingle. Section 11 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 10, January 6, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 10, January 6, 1880. Wiggles. Of these two wiggles, the first is what our artist makes of the outline given in Number 4 of Harper's Young People. And the second is a new wiggle, in which we hope our young readers will take as much interest as they have in those already published. Our Post Office Box During this new year, we anticipate much pleasant intercourse with our young friends. We thank them heartily for the favors already received, which from their genuine childishness we know have come direct from their own little hearts and hands. Our paper is received by children who live in all parts of this country in england germany france south america cuba and mexico and we would like to offer them a few suggestions which if faithfully carried out will add interest to our post office box and give much valuable information in the first place many of you have household pets birds squirrels fishes turtles and other little live creatures we are sure of this because already some of you have asked us questions regarding the care of them now, if you watch your pets carefully, you will learn many pretty facts of natural history, and it would do you good and please us if you would write us about their habits, what food they like best, and how they behave. If your communications are brief enough, we shall gladly print them. Then, as spring comes on, and it will come very soon to some of you in the south, watch for the first spring flowers, the sweet trailing arbutus, the pretty violets and windflowers, the crocuses, and the other early spring blossoms, and tell us when you find them, and in what pretty corner they were nestled in the woods. 
among bushes by the old stone wall or in the open sunny field let us see what little girl or boy will find the first willow pussies and you will all be interested to learn how much earlier the spring blossoms come to you who live south and west than to you in maine and canada then there will be the coming of the birds to watch for the robins and bluebirds some of you will see them all winter and the dear little snowbirds which sing and hop about so merrily on cold biting mornings when your own little fingers are half frozen as you scamper to school over the snow crust watch all these beautiful things of nature dear children and write us whatever you find out from your own personal observation in that way our post office box will become a delightful and instructive natural history exchange between the little folks of all sections of the country perhaps also the children in england and other lands beyond the sea will now and then favor us with bits of information about their own birds and flowers you must excuse us for writing so much leaving not room enough to print half of your own pretty communications earl writes from chicago i live on the west side and the ponds are frozen strong enough for skating i have been skating twice at jefferson park that does not look much like hunting for willow pussies does it and perhaps you are laughing because we remind you of spring now just when you are beginning to plan for skating parties but willows grow all around the ponds where you skate and you will never see the bare twigs without wondering how soon you can write and tell us the downy pussies have appeared i am six years old and i live in hastings nebraska i like harper's young people very much i have a duck a chicken a pig and a little rat dog whose name is jip i would like to know how to teach him to catch rats he by accident caught one the other day fastened in the pig pen fence and killed it before it got loose arthur s n quincy illinois my papa takes your paper for little folks and i like it first rate the stories in it are very good it is hard for me to say which i like best i wish you could see my pet chicken mary e m willie j m in gardens and hothouses where they are not liable to accident toads have been known to attain the age of thirty-five and even forty years the wonderful stories sometimes told of living toads being found embedded in solid rock where they must have been imprisoned for ages or in the heart of ancient trees are not well authenticated and such cases have never come under the observation of scientific men new york city i am very much obliged to you for telling me how to feed and house my land turtle i have also three water turtles one bullfrog two large toads and twenty small toads please tell me how to feed them i keep them in a large yard and i never feed them so i often wonder how they live your paper is getting better every week and the story about photogen and nycteris is about the best you have published lyman c your toads have found plenty of insects for food in the yard where you keep them they might be taught to eat sugar but they prefer a diet of worms ants and small bugs they will probably crawl under a stone or into some hole and lie numb all winter bullfrogs also eat worms and insects and very large ones are said to eat even small animals such as mice and moles water turtles eat the stems of water weeds and small mollusks but they can live a long time without food they might eat bits of bread you can try and see both they and your bullfrog would be grateful if you gave them a tank of water to swim in welcome letters are acknowledged from mamie t orange new jersey althea b macon city missouri f cogswell hudson wisconsin h w singer cincinnati ohio ernest b c shelbyville tennessee willie e h hartford connecticut and dorsey coat wabash indiana how to make a cheap sled procure a long narrow boy lay him on his back and fasten ropes to his legs and your sled is ready for use end of section eleven end of harper's young people volume one issue ten january sixth eighteen eighty